the Antichrist. He is one and he is many. 1 John 2, 18 through 19. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. John saw himself as living in the last hour. Before the coming of the Lord, he lived with the constant expectation for the coming of the Lord. Therefore, if John was in the last hour, then our generation is in the last few minutes or even the last few seconds. In 1 John 2, 18 through 19, we have Antichrist, singular, and we also have Antichrists, plural. This is not in any way to confuse us. Please remember, as I preach this sermon, you need to keep at the forefront of your mind that the Antichrist is truly one, but he is also many. He is one in the sense that he will stand as a person in opposition to Christ, and he is many in the sense that he has several people working with him to bring his purpose to fulfillment, people who are energized by his very spirit which is already in the world. Allow me to say this clearly to you. The Antichrist is one, but he is also many. We are living in an age that is opposed to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are living in an age that is Antichrist. It is important for you to know this and to remember that the society you are living in is not a society that is built up on the principles of this Bible. The culture in which you live in is not one that upholds the values of the Bible. When you go to school or university or to your workplace, you need to remember you are living in a world that has its own God. 2 Corinthians 4.4 the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. It is a sobering thought that the majority of the human population lives each day not knowing that there is a man called the Antichrist that will one day soon capture the hearts and souls of the people of this world. It is a sobering thought that the vast majority of the world is ignorant about this person. There is a debate amongst biblical scholars. Some believe that the Antichrist will be an individual, whilst others believe he will be a group of people creating a political system. However, they are both correct, because in a sense, he will be both a person and a political system. Apostle John wrote to the believers of his days, notifying them that although the Antichrist will be revealed in the last days, there are already many Antichrists. By that he implied that the spirit of the Antichrist which will be revealed in the last days has already taken the heart of many people. Enduring world... You live in an age like no other. You live in an age where there is a great falling away. You live in an age that calls good evil and evil good. You live in an age where men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. You live in an age where godly boundaries have been removed by the very fabric of society. You live in an age where the love of many has waxed cold. You live in an age where men and women worship mammon. You live in an age where mankind worships at the altar of Baal, Ashtoreth, and Moloch. You live in an age where mankind is being prepared to worship the Antichrist and accept his mark. You live in an age where men and women are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. You live in an age where mankind worships at the altar of self, self-love, self-adoration, self-exaltation. You live in an age where unclean spirits dwell. You live in an age where principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, and spiritual wickedness in high places dwell. You live in an age where seducing spirits dwell. You live in an age where demons and the devil are present. You live in an age where Bible prophecy is unfolding before your eyes. You live in an age of deception, an age where the foundations of truth are constantly under attack. You live in an age where the very institutions that should be pillars of light are often infiltrated by shadows. Matthew chapter 24 verses 3 to 10 And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. 
For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. In the poignant narrative of Matthew chapter 24, verses 3 to 10, our Lord Jesus Christ imparts a prophetic sermon often called the Olivet Discourse, outlining the precursors and events heralding his glorious return. This scripture is steeped in eschatological meaning, painting a vivid picture of unfolding events such as wars, rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes, and more, collectively termed as the beginning of sorrows. Yet amidst these forewarnings there lies a crucial element that is sometimes neglected in Christian discourse, the anticipated persecution of the faithful. When discussing end times, it's not uncommon for Christians to be drawn to the more sensational aspects of prophecy, the cataclysmic events, the rise and fall of nations, and the cosmic signs. These elements, while undeniably important, can sometimes overshadow other equally significant but more discomforting truths, such as the persecution Jesus said his followers would endure. In Matthew 24, 9, Jesus explicitly cautions his disciples, saying, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. This verse serves as a sobering reminder that persecution is not merely a relic of the past, confined to the annals of the early church, but a present and escalating reality as we approach the culmination of this age. It is an integral facet of the Christian journey, especially in these latter days. When studying Bible prophecy and encountering as many Christians as I have, one observes the wide range of eschatological views that exist. A common misconception among some believers is the belief that persecution will occur only during the Great Tribulation. When I began exploring the works of various prophecy experts, I noticed a striking lack of consensus. Some advocate a pre-tribulation viewpoint, others hold a mid-tribulation stance, and still others believe in a post-tribulation scenario. There are those who are convinced that Jesus will return before the Great Tribulation, sparing all Christians worldwide from suffering and persecution. Others argue that Christians will endure the first 3.5 years of the Great Tribulation before being taken by Jesus, and some believe that Jesus' return will occur after the Great Tribulation. In Christian eschatology, the range of differing opinions is vast. I've even encountered Christians who refuse communion with others simply because they do not share the same eschatological perspective. This attitude reveals a lack of maturity in faith. Mature Christians recognize that there is only one body of Christ. While interpretations of scripture and views on certain eschatological events may vary, they understand that anyone who believes in Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of the Lord and has accepted Him as their Savior, is a brother or sister in Christ, regardless of their eschatological interpretation. We, as Christians, should stand united, protect, and support one another. Returning to the subject of persecution, there are believers who think that persecution will never occur. However, Jesus explicitly warned us that persecution is imminent. We are aware of the earthquakes, wars, rumors of wars and pestilences, but sermons on persecution are exceedingly rare. Yet in various parts of the world, there are Christians enduring severe persecution for their faith in Christ. For them, the Great Tribulation is a present reality. In certain countries in the Middle East and Africa, Christians face immense suffering. They lose their lives, homes, and church buildings for their belief in Christ. They struggle to find employment and are ostracized by their families and communities. For these believers, the tribulation is not a future event, but a present ordeal. In some nations, Christians are already facing severe restrictions, such as being unable to buy or sell. Although the mark of the beast, as mentioned in Revelation 13, has not yet appeared on the global stage, the conditions they are living under are reminiscent of those described in this chapter of Revelation. I am not suggesting that the great tribulation has already begun, but for these individuals, their experiences of persecution make it seem as if it has. 
Some have fled these nations, living in uncertainty about the well-being of their families back home, enduring real persecution. I recently had a conversation with a missionary based in Afghanistan who shared that numerous underground Christian churches exist there. These churches convene in a believer's home, rotating the location weekly among different members' houses to maintain secrecy. To avoid raising suspicion, believers take a different route each time they go to attend church at another member's home. These underground home churches limit their size to 12 people. When a church reaches this number, it splits into two to minimize attention. This phenomenon is occurring worldwide, and it's essential to research and understand the extent of persecution that Christians are facing globally. Many of us Christians who are fortunate to live in countries where we can freely attend church, maintain our jobs, and live without fear of persecution, often do not fully appreciate our blessings. The reality is that this freedom is not the norm for Christians everywhere. It's important to recognize that persecution will come, even in this new year, and we should be prepared for it. In the year of our Lord 2024, prepare for persecution. It is coming, a sign of the end times. The tendency to overlook persecution in eschatological discussions may be due to the discomfort this topic brings. Persecution doesn't align with the more popular narratives of prosperity and comfort often heard in contemporary Christian circles. It lacks the appeal of a ten ways to be blessed sermon. Discussing suffering for one's faith is challenging and unsettling. It forces believers to confront the cost of discipleship, the reality of the cross, and the potential price of following Christ in an increasingly hostile world. Yet, it is crucial to remember that Jesus did not shy away from this topic. He was candid about the challenges his followers would face, emphasizing that persecution would come precisely because of their association with him. In John 15, 20, he states, Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. This link between the persecution of Christ and his followers underscores that enduring hardship for the gospel is an integral part of bearing his name. The truth is, the world will become increasing less accepting to Christ and the followers of Christ. However, I want to remind you one verse that should walk with you from now all the way through to eternity, Joshua 24, 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Allow me to provide some context surrounding Joshua 24:15. This significant verse comes from a speech delivered by Joshua, the leader of the Israelites, near the end of his life. It is part of Joshua's final address to the Israelites, in which he reminds them of God's unwavering faithfulness throughout their history from Abraham to their deliverance from Egypt and conquests in the Promised Land. Joshua had experienced the Lord's faithfulness like few men in human history. Consider what Joshua witnessed and heard. He knew of God speaking to Moses from a burning bush, instructing him to go to Egypt, confront Pharaoh, and demand, let my people go, and of God turning a stick into a snake. In Egypt, Joshua witnessed Pharaoh's stubborn refusal to listen to Moses, leading God to fight for his people through natural phenomena. The plagues unfolded, water turning to blood, frogs inundating the Egyptians' dwellings, outbreaks of lice and flies and locusts overwhelming the land. Despite repeated warnings from God to let my people go, Pharaoh remained unyielding. The Israelites witnessed pestilences, boils, hailstorms, and fearsome thunder and lightning. Throughout these events, God protected his people. The last plague brought mourning to Egyptian households, but the Israelites were spared as the angel of death passed over their homes marked with the blood of a slaughtered lamb. This act of deliverance, known as the Passover, is still celebrated today. After Pharaoh eventually agreed to let them go, he soon changed his mind and pursued them. Joshua, along with the Israelites, stood on the banks of the Red Sea, cornered by Pharaoh's army. They witnessed the waters part, allowing them to cross on dry ground. Once they were delivered from the Egyptians, Joshua saw how they were sustained by God's hand with manna and quail. 
Joshua was present when Moses, following God's command, struck a rock to provide water for the Israelites. During the battle with the Amorites, Joshua prayed for the sun to stand still, and God granted his request, providing more daylight to secure victory. As the leader of the Israelites, Joshua experienced the parting of the Jordan River, allowing the Israelites to cross into the Promised Land on dry ground. Under Joshua's leadership, the walls of Jericho fell after the Israelites marched around the city for seven days following God's instructions. Near the end of his life, Joshua simply stated, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Whatever may come your way this year, be it persecution or the winds and waves of life, remember that God is with you. Just as Joshua witnessed the faithfulness of God, you too have witnessed his faithfulness in your own life. We can all recognize the supernatural hand of God in our lives, especially when we've prayed and He has answered. Reflect on the times in your life when God has made a way where there seemed to be none. Consider the moments when your back was against the wall and all you had to rely on was your faith in the name of Jesus and God came through for you. Think back to when you were unsure of how you would pay your bills, but God in His blessing made a way. Recall those times when your health was deteriorating, yet God brought healing. It's important not to forget the things God has done for us. Each instance is a testament to God answering prayers and His steadfast presence in our lives. Therefore, we too, just like Joshua, can make this commitment. No matter what will happen in the year 2024, even if the whole world be against me, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There where God and I shall be, I am his and he is mine. Rage, you devil, if you wish, mock, you scoffers, if you wish. Come wind, come weather, come good, come evil. Day or night, time or eternity. I know I am his and he is mine. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Matthew 10, 32 to 33. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. Matthew 10, 32-33 Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father, who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father, who is in heaven. In other words, when the time of judgment before God comes, Jesus will vouch for everyone who embraced him as their Savior. He will stand alongside them before God the Father as a righteous witness to vouch for those who are His. For those of us living in first world countries like America, Canada, or the United Kingdom, and in many other nations, it has been relatively easy to be a Christian for centuries in comparison to other countries. There are countries where confessing Christ could cost you your life. But in the countries we live in, we don't face that level of persecution. Yet some of us still deny Christ, so that people will like us. Now imagine what Christians, who are more concerned with pleasing the world than pleasing God, will do when faced with real persecution. I encourage you to be bold with your faith. Knowing what you know, you know hell is a real place. Yes, you do. You know that it is an eternal place. Yes, you do. You know that it is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Yes, you do. You know that what goes there stays there. Yes, you do. You know that if someone is not born again, they will go there. Yes, you do. And yet, you keep the gospel to yourself because you are shy or timid, or because you are ashamed of the gospel, or perhaps you are scared of facing persecution. Matthew 28, 19 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. This is one of the biggest warnings in the Bible. Those who aren't willing to be associated with Jesus on earth won't be allowed to claim association with him in eternity. One of the signs we're living in the last days is the persecution of the church. The church will know more and more persecution. There is no way you can be a genuine Christian and be exempt. Dwell. You live in an age where demons and the devil are present. You live in an age where Bible prophecy is unfolding before your eyes. You live in an age of deception, an age where the foundations of truth are constantly under attack. You live in an age where the very institutions that should be pillars of light 
are often infiltrated by shadows. Church, my dear brethren, is not exempt from this infiltration. We are witnessing a time where, within the sacred walls of our sanctuaries, there is a sinister presence that lurks. There are demons in some churches. It's not about the theatrical demon possessions we see in movies. It is not about people levitating or strange apparitions, but it is something far more subtle and far more dangerous. It's the demons of false doctrines, of distorted truths, of misleading teachings that are of a demonic origin. Do you ever sit in a pew or listen to a sermon online and feel that something isn't right, that what you're hearing just doesn't align with the scriptures? That's because there's a battle, a spiritual warfare, raging within the very walls of the church. It's an insidious war where the enemy doesn't come with pitchforks, but with smooth words and charismatic teachings leading many astray. Now I want to take you to a passage in the Bible, 1 Timothy 4.1, where it warns us, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. What we are experiencing, what many of us are witnessing, is precisely this. In this sermon specifically, when we talk about demons in the church, we aren't talking about the literal creatures, but these false teachings that are of demonic origin. They are the doctrines of devils, and they are here. It's time to open our eyes and discern the times. It's time to guard our faith, to be vigilant, and hold fast to the true teachings of Christ. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 of the King James Version says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. We see in this verse that Peter acknowledges that false prophets have always plagued Israel, even in the days of the genuine prophets of God. People would attempt to gain recognition and build up a reputation for themselves by misleading God's people, by claiming that God had given them a message for Israel, when in actuality he had not. In this very verse, Peter reveals to us, the reader, that there will come a time where false teachers will rise up amongst the ranks of Christianity and they will teach heresy. What is heresy, you may ask? Well, heresy is anything that contradicts the scriptures, any teaching that twists the truth. Peter warns that these false teachers will do everything in their power to deceive Christians to deny Jesus Christ. This same verse then details to us how the story will end for these false teachers swift destruction. The warning of Peter is becoming more and more apparent in today's day and age. I have seen ministers who stand on pulpits and say that Jesus is not the only way to God. I have seen Christian ministers who attempt to discredit the life of Jesus, stating that Jesus sinned while he was on this earth. All of these statements can be described in one word. They are all heresy. Jesus is the only way to God the Father. Jesus never sinned either. He is the dictionary definition of perfect. If there are people who we should be very careful of as Christians in the world today, they are false prophets. We have been warned many times that these false prophets will come and deceive many. We were told that they will lead people astray, and it is not a lie. We can see them working in the world today. They are doing exactly what the Bible told us they will do. Their works are clearly in the world. They are taking people to the devil. They are taking people on the path of destruction, and they blind many of their victims with things they want to hear. If you are following a leader, a teacher, or a prophet because they are telling you what you want to hear and not what God wants you to hear, be sure you are following a false prophet. A sure sign of a false prophet or a wolf in sheep's clothing is that they please men. Galatians 1 verse 10 NIV Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. One of the works of these false prophets is that they want to be recognized as good people, so they please men instead of pleasing God. They water down the gospel message. My friend, the Word of God is not there to make you feel better about yourself 
or improve your self-esteem. The Gospel message is there for you to be saved. The Gospel message is there to guide you into the Kingdom of God, and the way only to do that is by first acknowledging that you are a sinner, and the wrath of God is the just reward for a disobedient sinner, and that you must be born again. In this sermon specifically, when we talk about demons in the Church, we aren't talking about the literal creatures, but these false teachings that are of demonic origin. They are the doctrines of devils, and they are here. It's time to open our eyes and discern the times. It's time to guard our faith, to be vigilant, and hold fast to the true teachings of Christ. Although the demons themselves are not standing up on the pulpit preaching in these churches, their teachings are being taught by human beings. This is just as effective as the demons themselves preaching it. You know, when we speak of a doctrine, we're talking about a teaching or a set of principles. So when we come across this term, doctrines of demons, in the scripture, what we're seeing is the teachings or principles put forth by demons. Now, the word doctrine can be used in reference to the biblical teachings of a church or even a pastor. But when Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.1, he was cautioning him about the ungodly, erroneous teachings that come straight from Satan and his demons. These aren't just harmless ideas, they're dangerously deceptive. Those who get ensnared by these doctrines of demons, the scripture tells us, will fall away from the faith. This means they'll depart from the foundational truths we hold dear about Christ's gospel. Let me emphasize this. Heeding to the doctrines of demons isn't just a minor misstep. It's a serious deviation from the truth of Christ's gospel. It is literally a heaven and hell issue. There are teachers in churches, in pulpits up and down this country who are teaching doctrines and beliefs literally from the very pit of hell. They are teaching things that are completely against the teachings of the Bible. In some churches, they don't even use the Bible. They don't even see the Bible as the word of God. I recently heard a minister preach a sermon on how Jesus is one of many roads to God. Can you imagine? I recently heard a preacher attempt to twist scripture to argue, adopt, and defend his sinful lifestyle. And you know what shocks me? In all honesty, it scares me. It doesn't shock me, it actually scares me. Yes, I chose the right words. What I'm about to tell you scares me, and it should scare you too. These false teachers who were preaching doctrines of demons, their churches were full. Their congregations were full. Literally hundreds of people were deceived, agreeing with a pastor who was twisting scripture and promoting doctrines of devils. Now what really scared me was just how many were in their congregation. Even a light glance at the Bible would tell you that this person is teaching in error, but their churches were full. I want you to think of the worst false prophet you have ever seen. And I want you to look at the congregation and just look at the amount of people who are sitting and listening to this person who genuinely believe that they are men or women of God when they are actually wolves in sheep's clothing. It honestly scared me just the sheer volume of people who are being deceived, who are being led down the wrong path by the doctrine of devils and the ministers who preach these doctrines. The number of people in their congregation showed me several things. One, deception is real, deception is powerful, and doctrines of devils are nothing to be played with. Two, the worst thing about deception is that those who are being deceived don't even know they are being deceived. Three, trust the Bible. Trust the Bible and the Bible alone. Because when you have been in the ministry as long as I have, you see people who start with sound doctrine and good intentions, and somewhere along the road they begin to propagate doctrines of demons. Trust the Bible, not men. Men change, women change. The Bible never changes. If you are confused, go to the Bible. If you are lost, go to the Bible. If you are unsure about a topic, go to the Bible. Your final authority is not a man, woman, church, congregation, denomination, YouTube channel, a vision you saw, a dream you dreamed, your mother or your father. No, no, no. Your final authority, if you are a believer, is the Holy Bible. People change. The Word of God never changes. There is a rise in churches preaching doctrines of demons. In our contemporary digital era, the rise in teachings, doctrines, and spiritual movements is unprecedented. 
The internet provides a platform for voices from all theological perspectives, including numerous self-proclaimed prophets. There are so many self-proclaimed miracle workers. There are so many self-proclaimed bishops. Everyone in today's era gives themselves a title. I am pastor so-and-so, or bishop so-and-so, apostle so-and-so, I am prophet so-and-so, or prophetess so-and-so. Do you know the title the Bible gives Moses at his death? Deuteronomy 34, 5 reads, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. Moses, the servant of the Lord. Humble. Moses was a man who God spoke to in a burning bush. Moses is a man who turned a stick into a snake. Moses is a man who made the Nile River turn to blood. Moses is a man who called the plagues to cover the land of Egypt. Moses is a man who parted the Red Sea. Moses is a man who made bitter water sweet at Marah. Moses is a man who brought forth water from a rock at Horeb. Moses is a man who called down manna from heaven. Moses is a man who appeared with the glory of the Lord on Mount Sinai. Moses is a man who brought forth water from a rock at Kadesh. Moses is a man who ascended Mount Sinai and received the Ten Commandments from God. Moses is a man who saw the back parts of God. Moses is a man who made his face shine after being in the presence of God. And yet, and yet the Bible describes him as simply the servant of the Lord. With all he did in his life, he is simply the servant of the Lord. That is what we should all aspire to. Recently, there has been a massive trend on the Internet where more and more people are claiming to have gone to heaven or hell. When listening to such things, be very careful that the person is not espousing doctrines of devils. I mention this because a member of my church recently showed me a video of a young man who claimed to have gone to both heaven and hell, and the things which he stated contradicted the word of God. The truth is, God can take someone to hell or heaven because he is God. He is not held accountable to me or you. However, our authority should be rooted in the Bible and not someone's personal experience. People's personal experiences do not trump the word of God. Be careful that you are not listening to a doctrine of devils. The safest thing to do is to stick to your Bible. What did Father Abraham say to the rich man when he died, went to hell, and attempted to send a message back to his brothers on earth? Luke 16, 29, 31. Abraham sigheth unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. The word of God is your final authority. If a human being says something contrary to the word of God, throw what they said out the window. If the most beautiful, holy angel approaches you saying anything outside of the word of God, throw it out the window. Satan and his demons know how to manipulate us, and that's why the doctrines of demons are so effective. Think about how long he has been around. Consider how long Satan and his demons have been on this earth, how many different generations of human beings they have deceived over the centuries. I am sure that over the decades, Satan and his demons have come to know human beings very well. I remember talking to a man who used to train dogs. Although he couldn't directly speak with the dogs, he had worked with them for so long and studied them so thoroughly that he had a certain intuition about dogs. Satan and his demons are intelligent beings, wiser and smarter than you and I. When we delve deeply into understanding the nature and scope of deceptive practices, we realize that the doctrines of demons are crafted with the intention of leading people away from the truth. The only way to safeguard ourselves from such deceit is by being grounded in an unwavering foundation which is the Word of God. By consistently immersing ourselves in the Scriptures, we not only gain knowledge but also cultivate discernment. Reading the Bible equips us with a spiritual compass, directing us towards the righteous path. Regularly studying the sacred texts makes us familiar with God's teachings, promises, and commandments. This familiarity acts as our shield, protecting us from falsehoods that may come wrapped in seemingly innocent or logical arguments. Furthermore, this consistent engagement with God's word nurtures our spiritual intuition. When we're deeply rooted in his teachings, our souls develop a heightened sensitivity to things that don't align with his principles. 
Just as a seasoned musician can instantly detect a false note in a symphony, a heart steeped in divine teachings can immediately sense any deviation from the holy doctrines. In a world full of distractions and myriad voices each clamoring for attention, it's easy to get swayed by eloquent arguments that appear sound on the surface but are fundamentally flawed. That's where the importance of knowing God's Word comes into play. When we are acquainted with what God says on any given subject, any variation or contradiction to that will immediately send up a red flag, warning us of potential deceit. In essence, to truly identify and combat the doctrines of demons, one must be fortified with knowledge and understanding of the Divine Word. Just as a building with a strong foundation can withstand storms, a believer fortified with scripture can resist the onslaught of deceptive teachings. The Bible is not just a book. It's a living tool of defense and guidance for all who seek to walk in the truth amidst a world filled with illusions. Satan and his demons, with their millennia of experience, have perfected the art of deception, making it even more crucial for believers to ground themselves in the scriptures. Only by consistently immersing oneself in God's word can one develop the discernment to identify and combat these demonic doctrines and remain steadfast in their faith.